Hello everybody. I am so happy to that you've chosen to join us again for this week's Bible study. Let us pray. Most holy and gracious Father, as always, we come and say thank you. We ask that you would guide our hearts and our minds to receive you afresh. In Jesus' name, amen. So we are still on article number 12, uh, the harmony of the law and the gospel. And our author writes, we believe that the law of God is the eternal and unchangeable rule of his moral government, that it is holy, just, and good, and that the inability which the scripture ascribes to fallen men to fulfill its precepts arises entirely from their love of sin, to deliver them from which and to restore them to a mediator to unfeigned obedience to the holy law is one great end of the gospel and of the means of grace connected with the establishment of the visible church. So we, we said that once we've been delivered uh, from trying to obey the law, and, and we said we never could, we are to be faith walking, faith talking, and faith acting followers of Jesus. Galatians 3 and 11 says clearly, no one is justified before God by the law because the righteous will live by faith. So we've been looking at a Roman in the book of Luke whose faith amazed Jesus. So our task is to take an up-close look, uh, an up-close personal look at what his life, uh, well, we're going to look at his life and try to pull out something that will help us in our walk of faith. We're not told the, the, the centurion's name. We're, we're only told his title, uh, which is centurion. I think that his title probably gives us more insight to his walk of faith than his name would have. So he was an officer in the Roman military, and yet he humbled himself before Jesus. Humility would not be one of the characteristics of most commanding officers. I mean, he had servants that, that loved, he, well, this man also had a servant that he loved enough to go outside of his normal sphere to get help when the servant was at the point of death. So he had a compassionate heart. He also loved the Jewish people and he showed it through his actions. He, even though the norm would be to mistreat them. So those are not characteristics that you would normally expect in an officer in the military. So we're going to pick up where we left off last time, at verse 6 of Luke, the seventh chapter. Verse 6 through 11. And remember, this is the NIV version. It says, so Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That's why I didn't uh, even consider myself worthy to come to you. For I, for, well, but say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one go and he goes, and that one come and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the man who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant healed. So the centurion first sent some elders to Jesus to make an appeal on behalf of him, on behalf of him and his servant. The servant was at home sick and at the point of death. So Jesus chose to go with them. And when he was almost there, the centurion sent friends and told Jesus, don't trouble yourself. And he said, I really don't deserve to have you come under my roof. 
He, he said, that's why I didn't come myself to make the request. I, I didn't consider myself worthy to come to you. Then he says to Jesus, just say the word and my servant will be healed. Then it is it, it, it's in verse 8. It's verse 8 that captures Jesus' attention. The centurion gives clarity as to why he asked Jesus, just speak the word and his servant will be healed. He says, for I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. This man, this centurion, understood authority. In fact, the verse could not, could have read, he, he could have said, for I also am a man under authority. He understood that he himself had certain rights because of his position. Because of his position, because of his authority, he had power over situations and he had power over people. But he was also a man under authority. He answered to Caesar. His authority came from Caesar. The centurion understood Jesus' position and what power that position held in heaven. He understood that Jesus' authority was backed by God, who made the universe. Therefore, Jesus had the power to heal his servant if he chose to exercise that authority. I don't know about you, but I've never paid much attention to that phrase, a man under authority. Authority is usually something that is bucked. You know, we don't want anybody being over us. There are people that have lost good paying jobs because they couldn't handle being under authority. A lot of folks want authority. They want to have the power to be in charge, the power to lead, but they fail to realize there's a principle to leadership. To have authority, you must live under authority. You can't be a good leader until you're a good follower. Folk want to be in leadership position at work, but they're not faithful. They're not faithfully following the managers that are over them. And, and, and right here, I do like James Brown. He, he said, let's hit it and quit. I, I quickly hit some preachers. It, it's like some preachers want to be a pastor of a large church, and yet they're not willing to faithfully sit and learn from the pastor that they have. There's no getting around the fact that if we want to have authority, we must first be willing to live under authority. To be a good leader requires that you be a good follower. Satan fall from heaven was because he didn't want to be under authority. He, 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 he was instrumental in, in Adam and Eve being kicked out of the garden because they didn't want to be under authority. God has placed a system of authority in our world that requires faith to live under. God is a God of order. He knows that in order for things to work, somebody must have authority. And everybody has to be under authority. Everybody has authority over somebody. It's like children, wives, husbands, employers, employees, government leaders, church leaders, and the list goes on and on. Everybody is under authority, even if you are authority, even if you are uh, have authority, you are still under authority. These are authority structures God has placed in the lot in our lives to protect and guide us to His will. First Thessalonians, the fifth chapter, verse eighteen says, "Give thanks in all circumstances." For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. I don't know about you, but sometimes I confuse position with worthiness or, or even with the qualifications of that position. You know how we are guilty of putting our mouth on folk in position. 
It's like, how did they get in? How did they get there? How did, I know more than they do. I'm better qualified than they are. And, and, and that may be very, that very well may be true. But God didn't put you in charge. God will work through a person in a position that he is unqualified for to accomplish his person purpose. Is that not what he did with Moses? God can work through a pagan king to bring about his purpose. Is that not what he did with Pharaoh to free Israel? God doesn't call the qualified. He calls the willing. We are living in a time when everybody wants to be in charge and nobody wants to follow. To the centurion, authority was a good thing. When he says he too is a man under authority, he is saying that Rome has his back. When he tells those under him to do this or that, they must obey because of the power that is backing him. Likewise, this centurion recognizes that Jesus is under authority. God has put creation under the command of Jesus. And he can command it as he pleases. This centurion gets it. He sees God the Son's role as a person who submits to the authority of God the Father. When the disciples were concerned about Jesus eating in, in John 4 and 34, Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of, of him who sent me and to finish his work. The Roman, this Roman centurion, sees that submission also brings a great authority along with it. Submission to authority gives the person who submits all the power granted by that authority. The centurion had the authority of Rome behind him, and he had control of those under him. And, and, and so Jesus had all the authority of the Father behind him. When Jesus, when, when the Father tells the Son to carry out a command, the Son has all the power he needs to do it. When we truly understand authority and how it works, it's powerful. Now, I should put a disclaimer here. I am not there yet. More times than not, majority of the time, the Holy Spirit has me teaching out of my struggles, not my accomplishments. So I, this is where I struggle, just like everybody else. So I'm right there with you. But, but when and if we get it, it changes everything. Me submitting to and obeying the word of God means that I have all of heaven backing me up. When I obey God's word, that puts all of heaven in my corner. And that's amazing. When Jesus heard the faith of the centurion, he was amazed. And, and in my mind, he stopped in the middle of the road. And, and verse 9 says, When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following him, you know, Jesus always had a crowd. He says, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. Y'all, that is hard coin as as my previous pastor used to say that's some hard coin for our generation it requires great faith to operate in this realm and yet jesus says when we do when we understand to the point of actually doing it we demonstrate the kind of faith that he rarely sees Faith that is not based on what I can see or what I can figure out. In fact, I don't even try to figure it out. 
That's far above my pay grade. This, this centurion, as far as we know, he never met Jesus. He never came. He just acted on faith believing that Jesus could heal his servant based on the fact that he was a man in authority and under authority. My 10-year-old grandson loves to go on adventures with his dad. His dad will, will have an adventure in mind, and all he has to say to my grandson is he'll say, Ready, Henry? And my grandson's response is, Ready, Daddy? And off they go. This, this kid can, if, if, they are, if they're driving to the adventure, he can sit in the back seat looking out of the window with anticipation, already excited about being excited. He never once says, Daddy, where are we going? What are we going to do? Where, you know, never says any of that. He trusts his daddy completely. I can't even imagine how much better my life would be if I had that kind of faith in Jesus who has the backing of heaven for his purpose and for his will. Can you imagine God, the Holy Spirit saying, ready? And you fill in your name there. Ready, Freddie, ready, Lamona, ready. Just ready, whatever your name is. And your response is, Ready, Daddy? That's the kind of faith that amazes Jesus. Until next time, go and amaze Jesus with your faith. Bye-bye.